In the early 2000s, behavior scientists tried and tested many assumptions to model our cognitive processes so that we can have a better understanding of mental models. And one of them I want to talk about here is goal framing theory of Lindenberg and Stack. Goal framing theory says that human behavior is guided by three overarching goal frames and only one frame is dominant at a given moment, shaping how we interpret a situation and what we pay attention to. So what is an overarching goal frame? It is like the main lens your brain is using at given moment to decide what matters most. Among all the options, you frame one option and take the shot. It answers the question, what is my main goal right now? And depending on your answer, it guides you to what you pay attention to, how you interpret a situation and what action you decide to take. So it calibrates your perspective to that particular situation you are facing and if you may remember from our system thinking series that perspective actually defines what is a problem and what is not and according to Lindenberg and Stack at any given time three goal frames competes inside your brain they are hedonic goal frame instrumental goal frame and normative goal frame I like to think them like Greek gods and goddesses, how Dionysus would see, how, decide and act, how Hermes would see, decide and act, and how Athena would see, decide and act. If you are familiar with Greek mythology, you might guess them. Hedonic goal frame focuses on feeling good now. It is concerned with finding pleasure and comfort and avoiding pain and effort. For example, when you choose the car instead of walking to your 500 meters away store, your hedonic golf frame won the competition inside your brain. On the other hand, instrumental golf frame focuses on guarding and improving one's resources. It is concerned with financial rewards, gaining or guarding status, performance gains and efficiency. It can be as simple as choosing to cook at home to save money after a long and exhausting day or it can be a complex situation like weakening labor union through causing conflict among them so your company which you own can keep more profits for itself thus for yourself. And normative goal frame focuses on acting properly because it is obsessed with doing the right thing and being accepted socially. When this frame wins the competition in our brain, we prioritize rules and values of our society over the other goal frames, even at the cost of self-interest. Even though all these three goals are always present for all of us, only one dominates at a time based on the situation and that dominant frame shapes perception of the situation, directs your attention and influences your decision making. And they can be manipulated through contextual cues or how a message is framed. So one can trigger a shift from one goal frame to another through means of communication. Take wealth inequality for example, one of the humanity's largest and most persistent challenges. The gap between the richest and the poorest has grown so vast that it's nearly impossible for the average person to grasp and let alone confront it. This overwhelming scale activates a response of acceptance, which is a mental model called system justification. Governments, corporations and media skillfully exploit our goal frames to reinforce this acceptance. Media often trigger our hedonic goal frame, distracting us with entertainment and consumerist messages that prioritize immediate pleasures over systemic change. Governments manipulate our normative frame by promoting narratives like economic growth benefits everyone, urging compliance and collective stability rather than critical questioning. And corporations tap into our instrumental frame, convincing us to focus narrowly on individual success, productivity and efficiency, so framing wealth disparity as a natural outcome of personal achievement rather than systemic design. And through these subtle yet persistent shifts, we stop seeing extreme inequality as a problem. It fades from our radar, becoming simply the way things are, which neutralizes our drive for meaningful intervention. And once a majority of population is neutralized, then organizations and even society itself completely stop seeing this as a problem to be addressed. 
And this shows the beauty of GFD, goal framing theory, that it can be applied to individual level, organization level, and even to societal level because you can aggregate those goal frames. And, and, and another beauty of this model is that it's natural connection to mental models. As said in the Valtic Chronicles example, if society holds a mental model of system justification, which leads to acceptance for that situation, then your goal frame shifts towards which one provides the acceptance on that moment. If we zoom out from individual level and look at to the society as a whole, something more powerful begins to emerge, what we call a social phenomenon. It is not just a collection of behaviors, it's a pattern that arises when those behaviors become widespread, self-reinforcing and culturally embedded. It is the difference between one person choosing to overwork and the society where burnout is normalized. When enough people repeatedly act from similar goal frames shaped by similar mental models and influenced by the same systemic cues, those actions start to form visible patterns, what we call a social phenomenon. These aren't accidental, they are structured, maintained and reproduced across generations, institutions and communication. So whether it's capital concentration, anti-elite rhetoric, externalization of costs or financial markets, these are not isolated events or individual failings. They are emerging structures of deeper cognitive and systemic loops, echoing our dominant paradigms reflected through the behaviors we collectively enact. Let's take a concrete example. The financial markets, while they are often portrayed as cold, data-driven and feel like they cannot be related to something born out of soft topic like behaviors, they are indeed deeply social phenomena. Every price movement is shaped by millions of individual decisions driven by mental models about risk and value, goal frames like profit maximization and emotional cues like fear or euphoria. And these individual behaviors repeated and amplified through institutional structures and media narratives, which create patterns like booms, busts and bubbles. As a matter of fact, financial markets do not reflect any sort of rational reality. Yeah, they don't. Sorry, mainstream economists. It mirrors the dominant beliefs and expectations and incentives of the society. They are absolutely the product of our beliefs shaped by the narratives and in this way, financial markets are not separate from our culture. They are not some glorious order of merit and hardcore science just because you are crunching some numbers. They are culture, simply translated into numbers. They emerge from us, respond to us and shape us in return. And just like any other phenomenon, if we want to shift their trajectory, we must first understand the mental models they arise from. And this brings us to the types of phenomena. Just like Lindenberg suggested in Golf Framing Theory, we can think any social phenomenon in the same structure because those phenomena are emerged from behaviors, so they should inherit their DNA, right? So we have obviously three types of phenomena. Phenomena emerging from instrumental purpose-seeking behaviors, phenomena emerging from normative purpose-seeking behaviors, and phenomena emerging from hedonic purpose-seeking behaviors. For example, when we talk about phenomenon of financial markets, we can sense that it feeds on instrumental purpose-seeking behaviors, those driven by the pursuit of efficiency, control and personal gain. Think of the behaviors it rewards and amplifies, day trading to chase short-term profits even if it adds no value to the stock economy offshoring labor or automating jobs to maximize shareholder returns, buying or dumping stocks based on quarterly earnings, which has nothing to do with long-term sustainability, creating complex financial products like derivatives or credit default swaps, tools designed to optimize risk-taking, risk exposure and return, often with little connection to the real economy, and pump and dump schemes where influencers or institutions manipulate perception for quick gains, and even greenwashing where companies perform symbolic eco-actions just to attract investors while maintaining exploitive practices underneath. These aren't just isolated tactics, they are normalized behaviors within the system guided by the dominant golf frame, which is instrumental golf frame. 
maximize gains, minimize losses, optimize outcomes. And when millions act from that frame over time, we get a market culture obsessed with speed, scale and surface optics. That is what creates the phenomenon of the financial markets, not the numbers, but the collective behavior behind the numbers.